Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The season of Christmas happens to not only be the shortest season of the church year, but also the one that ends up in quite a different place than it began. How festive are those Christmas Eve services? Even the first gospel procession of the year is appointed for Christmas Day. I bet we're all moved by the message of our Savior's birth, the lights, the candles, and the Christmas trees. And yet, only a few days later, we are remembering not our Lord's lowly birth in the stable and the singing of the angels in the heavens, but a rushed exodus from the land of Israel and the slaughter of many innocents. It is almost as if we have gone from joy and gladness to desperation and death. So much for that Christmas spirit, right? But there is a good reason for this sort of liturgical movement. While our Lord's entrance into the world is a most joyous event for the whole people of God, He has not come into a world that loves Him. This world hates God. It hates God more than anything else because its master is not the Lord of life, but the demonic powers of sin and death. And that is the world that you live in. As we draw this Christmas tide to a close, we are reminded that Christ came not to be loved by the world, but hated by it. And this fact leaves us with the uncomfortable reality that as it has so hated him, so will it hate those who follow him. This is why the Christ child and his family are forced to flee. Joseph is warned that Herod seeks to kill the child's life, and undoubtedly if they had stayed, it would have been Jesus, that infant child, who would have come under the knife of the world. So they flee to Egypt, that the incarnate Lord might live yet a little while longer in the world. Fortunately, for all the male children to and under who were left behind in Bethlehem and the surrounding region, that knife of the world came for them. To be associated with Jesus was to bring the wrath of the world and a murderous departure from it. How great must the wailings of those mothers and fathers have been at the slaughter of their children? And how powerless were they to stop it? In one sense, Christmas tide ends not with hymns of praise, but with the screams of terror. Now, I know some of you have heard me say it before, but I will say it again. The Word of God is the most honest book that has ever been written. If you read it carefully, it will tell you more about the world and the way things really are than any other book that has ever been written. And today, there is a twofold reminder for the people of God. First, Jesus is the Savior. And secondly, those who follow him will undergo fiery trials for his name. That Jesus is the Savior is not merely known through the singing of the angels and the fulfillment of prophecy, but also through the coming shedding of his blood. Jesus came into the world to pay for the sins of the world. But the just payment of sins only comes through the fulfilling of its curse. It comes through death. In the beginning, the Lord of all life had given the gift of life freely. And that gift of life is the greatest gift the world will ever know because without life, nothing else has any meaning at all. That is why God demands life as a payment for sin. It is the only thing we have that ultimately means anything. And demand it, he does. But not from us. Yes, we will all die in the flesh, but for those who follow the Christ, they will not die so as to pay for their own sins. That is, we will not die to fulfill the curse of the law. For the curse of the law for sinners is not merely physical death, but everlasting death. 
This is why the Christ has come to die in the place of sinners, to save us from everlasting death, which is the just punishment for sin. Jesus Christ has come to give up his life in order to save ours. The thing of it is, as with his entrance into the world, so with his death. It must take place at the proper time. To die as an infant would deprive us of the word of God, divinely spoken, not through prophets and apostles, but from the mouth of the incarnate Lord. We would be deprived of the full counsel of God and even the institution of his holy sacraments. No, Jesus cannot yet die for the sins of the world because he has not fulfilled all that his heavenly Father has sent him to do. So he must wait a little while longer until that time is fulfilled. And it will be fulfilled after his three years of public ministry, after raising up the disciples to continue in his stead, after teaching all that is necessary for the creating and sustaining of faith in this age. Only then will he die as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And die, he does, for sinners just like us. The babe born in Bethlehem and at first driven to Egypt will willingly shed his blood under the murderous and demonic knife of the world to rescue us from the wages of sin, which is death. We have been saved by the Christ who has paid for our sins as the purchase price of his holy and righteous life. That's why Jesus came into the world. He knew we couldn't save ourselves. And so he saved us from the everlasting death that we deserve. The flight into Egypt and the slaughter of the innocents really is a good way to end the Christmas season. Because it so fittingly points to what is coming for the Christ child. He must die for us. He must shed his blood for us or there will be no hope for us. But thanks be to God that there is hope. We have hope because Jesus has died for us. He has merited for us the forgiveness of our sins by laying down his holy and his precious life before the eyes of our Heavenly Father. And now, in turn, it is us who appear holy and righteous in him. We are those who are robed in white. And take note, that is the historical color of Christmas. Because the righteousness of that sinless child has become our own. And when we stand before God on the day of judgment, there will be nothing to fear. Not sin, not death, not the everlasting suffering of hell itself. Because we will appear with the righteousness of Christ that has been given to us freely here in time. And in which we will appear for all eternity. Of course, we're not in eternity yet. Just like Christ had not yet fully come into his own at the flight into Egypt and the slaughter of the innocents, we have to live in this world for some time yet. And today, we are reminded that as the world sought to oppress Jesus and eventually cry out for his blood, so will the world persecute the people of God. The end of the Christmas season not only reminds us that we have a Savior, but also that we might very well undergo much suffering for the sake of the gospel. I think if I had preached this message of suffering not so many years ago, it might have been received with a little bit of a mixed mindset. Certainly, there is the recognition that this is what the Word of God says. But amidst the many freedoms our people has enjoyed for some time, especially in regard to the things of God, it might have seemed that this message of suffering were more befitting of other Christians elsewhere. But I think we all know and can sense that the oppression and the hostility that once faced our Lord may very well be coming to our own lands and our own people. It may very well be that we are going to have to face our own fiery trials if we have not had to do so already. 
It's why St. Peter reminds us in our epistle lesson, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Suffering, oppression, even the shedding of blood may very well come upon the people of God. May very well come upon us. But that shouldn't surprise us. It is entirely expected. If the world hated Jesus, the very Savior of the world, how much more will it hate those who follow him? That's the world you live in. And for your part, it is becoming a more hostile world to those who follow Christ. We see it all around us. The eschewing of God from public life, lawsuits against Christians in their places of employment, threats against churches and their schools, the murderous and idolatrous greed of abortion, and the absolute hatred of those who oppose it. And at some point, all of this truly hate-filled language and life aimed against Christ and his people will boil over into the demonic action against God and his kingdom. When it does, we shouldn't be surprised. And when we suffer for the name of Jesus, as Peter says, we should rejoice and be glad. Because opportunity is given for the truth of Christ to be made known and his glory to be revealed. We are blessed when we are insulted for being Christian. When people call us stupid or ignorant or naive for believing in God and his Christ. If we should lose our jobs or have our church and school persecuted, we should not be ashamed, but understand that we are not worthy to partake of such sufferings for the name of Jesus. But our Lord has raised us up for such times that God might be glorified in the name of Christ. Our Lord knows how to get it done in the midst of suffering. It is at times why he allows such hardships to take place. The Christ came not to be loved, but to be put to death that something beautiful might come forth from it. He died that we might live. And now, sometimes the church must endure agony like her Lord, so that something beautiful may come forth, even if we don't know what that's going to look like. Just consider our Old Testament lesson, because we see this very reality at work there. Joseph was sold into slavery, right? We remember this from Sunday school. It looked to Jacob like his most beloved son was dead. Yet God had other plans in mind. He took the great suffering of Joseph and Jacob and turned it into something glorious. What the world and the devil had sought for evil, God had used for the good of his kingdom. Joseph was to become second only to Pharaoh. And in the time of Jacob and his family's great need in the midst of that famine, they were brought to Egypt to live there safely with Joseph. The Lord had remained faithful, and his plans of redemption were being fulfilled. So it was then, and so it is now. Thus, as those who have been loved by the Christ, whose sins are forgiven, and whose eternal life is certain and secure, let us suffer according to God's will, knowing that his ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. Let us, as Peter says, entrust our souls to our faithful creator while yet doing good in this world that means to do so much evil to us. We have every reason to rejoice and be glad, even though the world may come for us as it did for our Savior <clears throat> and those innocence in Bethlehem. We have so much to be thankful for because our sins are paid for. The curse that hangs over us has been removed. The way to heaven itself has been opened in the blood of Christ. And the future for us, it is eternal glory. Whatever our lives may be like in the coming months or years, one thing about them is going to be certain. They will be lived with a view 
to eternity. We are not living for this world as the Christ did not live for this world. We are living for the kingdom of heaven in all eternity as Christ himself lived for it. So today and every day, rejoice and be glad. Even though demonic suffering and persecution may come as it has in the past and will in the future. In the name of Jesus, amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.